So I went down for my first meeting with Sam Peckinpah at Twickenham Studios. Now, I'd already shot a movie called Strange Affair with Michael York at Twickenham Studios. It wasn't a foreign place for me. I knew the studio well. I felt very comfortable going there again. I went up to the offices where I'd been many times before. And I went to Sam Peckinpah's office. Um, I there met for the very first time a lady who was to become a lifelong friend of mine called Katie Haber who was his secretary at the time, and there she was sitting, typing outside and taking phone calls. And we said hello, and she said, I won't keep you a few moments, and Sam's ready to see you, and I went in and saw him. There was a kindness to him that I thought was instantly recognizable, but there was also an aura around him, whether that was something I'd been told or something I felt, I don't know, but um, it, was, it was a pressure meeting him, I remember that. Um, it was quite terrifying. And he was lovely to me, but as I say, very confrontational. And we seemed to get on very well. It was a brief meeting. And when I left him, he said he would like to meet me again. So I knew that I was in for a second chance. <laughs> So there was interview after interview after interview. And each time he was testy, even more testy. Um, each time he was a little more personal. He tried to be very threatening and very frightening, but I wasn't frightened by him. I found him interesting. And um, I liked our meetings, and we had many, many, many meetings after that. Again, 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 I was called, must have been probably about six times. Now I went away on holiday. And on holiday, I got a call from my agent to say I was being called back to test. The script pages were sent, and when I got back from holiday, I read them, learned them, and went to Twickenham Studios to test. I'm sorry. And the worst part of all my, all my meetings and the test and everything was after I had tested, because I knew now I'd put myself on a line. I knew now how badly I wanted this thing, how badly I wanted this role. It becomes, as it does for every artist, at this point it becomes a matter of life and death. Of course it's not, but it feels that way, you know? It was so important. Are you sorry, sorry? I'm just sorry. Sorry, sorry. Pause now, a week goes by, and as I said, that was the toughest week of all. And then I was called back to the studio. And I wasn't told it was a, a final issue or that I was going to be cast. I was just told there was one more meeting still to be had. So I went along to Twickenham Studios. I walked in, Katie was my old friend by now, and I said, hi, how are you? <laughs> it was great to see you. And as I was talking to Katie, she was on the phone and she was involved in a very, it seemed like a difficult, conversation at the time and, and that she didn't really have time to talk to me so she sort of waved at me okay in a minute and, and continued with her conversation and as she was continuing with her conversation I noticed that the door to Peck and Pa's office was slightly ajar and I thought I wonder if I should go in or not or and she turned her back on me she spun round on the chair and turned her back on me which made it even more difficult she was now on the phone the door was slightly ajar and it appeared to me that there was also people talking in this room. So I sort of hedged towards the door and I moved the door just a little to see if I could see in the room and see if anyone was expecting me. And there was a heated discussion going on, extremely heated. Three men and loud words and a lot of waving of arms. And I felt embarrassed. I was caught between a rock and a hard place. I was half in the door, half out, I didn't know whether I should now go in because I thought they'd, they were aware of my presence. But they didn't seem aware because they didn't stop talking and they didn't stop arguing, which I found extraordinary. So I stood in this sort of gap of the doorway watching these three men, three grown men, Dan Melnick, Sam Peckinpah and Dustin Hoffman, I realised is what it was, all having a heated discussion. So I hovered in the doorway. They paid no attention to me whatsoever and they continued with this bout. I stood there for a few seconds. And I thought, they don't know I'm here. I mean, I, in my head, I went, they don't, they don't know I'm here. So I went back out the door, and as I did, I dropped my eye line. And as I dropped my eye line, I realized 
that these three men were standing with their trousers around their ankles. <laughs> Absolutely naked trousers round their ankles. And I looked down and I thought, oh God. <laughs> and I looked up again and these three men burst into extraordinary laughter and looked at me and said, welcome, Amy. And that was their way of telling me, I mean, obviously they wouldn't have done, they wouldn't have performed such a rigorous joke and, and you know, had me arrive in this room if they weren't to give me this fantastic news that I, and it was actually Sam who said it, it wasn't Dan, it wasn't Dustin, they all stopped and Peck and Pie just looked at me and he said, welcome aboard Amy. And that's how they told me. In England one does um, become slightly insulated in one's own world and our own films and what we are doing and these sort of international marketplace and international stars were all so far away from us, I suppose, in the world that I was caught up in, apart from the likes of James Mason and the people that I'd already worked with, but international stars were not something that you met on an everyday basis or, or knew or came to know. So I didn't really know very much about Dustin Hoffman, apart from the fact that I had seen The Graduate, which I thought he was absolutely sensational in. And I thought he was incredibly sexy and a gorgeous guy. And um, so I really looked forward to meeting him. My gut feeling as I met him was that he was tiny. I couldn't get over how small he was in comparison to what I had thought he was going to be. But he was a really sweet man um, with a huge sense of humor that was evident immediately. Uh, sparkle, twinkle in his eyes, completely, you know, disarming, slightly disarming, loved that, he loved that, he loved to be disarming and he knew he was, um, he would take you on and his intention was to make you feel disarmed and he did it very well and I loved it, I responded to that and I enjoyed it and it was the same thing all the way through the movie, we had a fantastic relationship within the movie, the same thing, um, from emotional turmoil and sometimes huge sparks and incredible chemistry, which is what it needed to make this film work, to mammoth laughter of huge proportions that went on for days, which he instigated and I responded to. Leave me alone! Stop it! Stop! Tell me! I'll stop the car! I just want to know! Promise. Tell me! Stop! I'm telling you! You asked for it! Okay. All right. Find the car. Ooh. 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 You asked for it. Chicken! You're nuts. You are terrible. You're nuts. Go, Wicked! Dustin and I had very, had a very different work ethic. That was painfully obvious from the moment that we started working together. But it was fantastic, and that was, that was part of the extreme, the extreme different way that we worked was part of the magical chemistry, I think, that came together and ignited and made this fantastic energy between these two individuals. Because he was most certainly a method actor, he always had been, he told everyone, he, he still is, you know, that's the way he works, he's a method actor, I respect that a thousand percent, it's wonderful. But I am not, I'm ex instinctive, everything I do is natural, is the first thing I think of. It just is, it's an, I'm instinctive, he's method. Two totally, totally extreme different ways of working. This is my affair, the lights. Go upstairs and turn on all the lights. They won't be able to see me, but I'll be able to see them. Go ahead. No. No, I won't. Go. The very first thing that Peckham Pie did when we began the production, in, in the pre-production of the film, we did rehearsals at the studios. We did two weeks of rehearsal, which was phenomenal, and something that was a really big credit for any major company to give people rehearsal time, because that was extremely expensive, to bring everyone in to work with Peck and Pa and to do rehearsals. But we did two weeks, which was wonderful. In those two weeks, we really got to know one another inside out. Why don't you take my uh, heater out of the study? Because it's 
going upstairs. And Peckinpah then, after the weeks of rehearsal, when we were really working well together, he then made another major decision, which at the time, at 20 years of age, I found a little personal, a little encroaching into my personal space, because I had a boyfriend who loved me very dearly, and I did him too, and we were about to get engaged, and suddenly Peckinpah announced that he wanted me to leave by train for Cornwall with Dustin and the writer, David Z. Goodman, and he wanted me to spend the first two weeks in Cornwall, apart from my boyfriend, and to live with Dustin, not in the same bed or the same bedroom, but to live in the same hotel, every, to spend every hour with him that I had. And it was so clever, because it was this relationship in Straw Dog at the beginning of the movie starts with a marriage that's on the rocks, about to disintegrate. And without the pre-knowledge of how these people had got on in their existing lives together, if we didn't know how they, how they came to, how this fallout became, and how uncomfortable they had become with one another, if we never knew how comfortable they once were, if that makes sense, there was nothing, there was nothing to build on this relationship. So we had to form a really fantastic relationship, Dustin and I, and then we had to break it down before the film started. Which Dustin believed in wholeheartedly, because of course he was method, so this for him was great. For me, I thought, I don't understand why we can't just arrive on the first day of set. And I can't say, well, we've had a great relationship, but now it's on the rocks. <laughs> that, for me, was how it was going to work. But for him and for Peck and Pa, no. We had to live through this, and we had to get there. We had to arrive at this place. And it was a fantastic test of time and patience. Do you think I'm strange? Occasionally. The being together every day, David Z. Goodman following us round everywhere with his little notebook, writing down all our great times, all our humorous times, all our crisis, all the things that we pushed buttons in each other to trigger off emotions and to make things happen. The thing that happens in Straw Dogs, which is a wonderful moment, the chewing gum, you know, when she's taking him on and she's testing him and she's chewing gum and paying no attention to him and she's... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and doing this. This came out of a really true, playful moment. That was all ad-libbed, and it was all written down by David Z. Goodman. All our dialogue, the way we behaved with one another, everything we did, that script and his and I relationship as David and Amy Sumner was based on Susan George and Dustin Hoffman, the real people. Peckinpah created drama all the time. He created it offset as much as he created it on set. And that was really, I think, I don't think, I know, it was ultimately to get the best out of people, but he was so talented, um, as I said, that he, I think he second-guessed people all the time, and he wondered if they were so intelligent as he. And in case they weren't, he worked people into a frenzy. The bar's closed. He pushed them to the limit to make them react and make them spontaneously crazy, because he wanted these crazy people. He had built up this kind of hysteria that he implanted within, within each and every one of these individual people. He wanted to make them all be their characters. With me, it didn't work, because when he attacked and got ferocious with me and tried to get... I just shut down and said... And he knew it. And I, these are the times, very testy times, that we had together. And God knows, we had many. And I would just shut down and say even at 21 years of age, I mean, don't push me. I have what you want. I have these emotions inside me. I can deliver everything you want me to deliver, but you don't need to squeeze it out of me, and you certainly don't need to come and put a knife in my stomach to make me bleed. I will bleed for you of my own accord, because I'm an actress, and I will bleed, but you will not make me bleed by hurting me. Is David all right? Fine. Enjoying himself. 
May I come in? All right. I was obviously frightened. Yes, I'd committed to do this film. I'd seen the... I'd read the script through and through and through. I'd gone to all these auditions. I knew what was required in terms of a rape scene. But that's really all it said. It, it, didn't, it never went into the specifics on paper. So I needed to know what was required of me, as anybody would. And they were not prepared. He was not prepared to give me that. And it did come to blows. And I did walk out and I did say if he wasn't prepared to tell me what I was going to shoot. He actually, um, he gave me some rough notion on that day and the rough notion was extremely rough and I didn't like what I heard at all. And I wouldn't have been prepared to do what he asked me to do. So I said, on the basis of what you've just asked, find yourself another Amy. And I walked out. That caused huge upheaval, as you can imagine. And to cut a very, very long story short, there came a time when he had to come back to the table and discuss with me legitimately what he was intending to do and how we could, you know, it was just a grown-up meeting, how we're going to do this. We together, Sam and I, and Del Henny. Um, how are we going to make it work? How are we going to make it the, you know... And one thing he did say to me was he wanted it to be the best rape scene that had ever been shot. And the one thing that I said to him in return is, I would like to achieve that for you, and I will endeavour to do so. But on my terms. Please leave me. I told Peckinpah that he needed to trust my ideals and my view of this scene. And seeing as I was the actress who was going to be reenacting this situation, he only needed to look at my eyes. And if my eyes didn't convey enough to him of the fear and the threat, Please. then I wouldn't be good enough. There's always been um, endless controversy about the undeniable fact that Amy at one point found it pleasurable. That was the way it was written. That was the way Sam Peckinpah wished it to be interpreted. And I agreed when I took on the role that I would make that interpretation. Remember when I took care of you, Amy? This man, this boy, Charlie, had been a young love in her life. And there still was a huge conflict within her mind. You know, her husband clearly wasn't manly enough for her in some aspects. He, um, he didn't stick up for her. He didn't protect her. She loved him passionately, it was obvious. But in some ways, he was not the great protector, which is what she was fighting for. And all of a sudden, she was back with him again for one small moment. It was nasty, it was unkind, and it became more than that. For her, it became loving and protective. I will always be enormously proud of Straw Dogs. It will never go away. I never want it to go away. People always say to me when they start interviews, it's always brought up and they always ask me if I mind. How could I mind? It was a turning point in my life, in my career. I became international, internationally known for it, which is any artist you want to become. You want to sweep across the board. You just don't want to be a star in your own country. You want to move on. So for me, it was fantastic. It has become my middle name. I mean,